thank you all for waiting for me to to um, get this running. I unfortunately wasn't able to join yesterday's session of um, trying this out, so um, this would have been better. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about my PhD project, which is called Predictability of Evolutionary Trajectories. And a little bit of background about me is that I've just um, started my PhD at the Computational Cell Biology Group at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, Germany. Um, this is at the moment a computational group and I will be the first person working with the minimal cells and also doing wet lab experiments. So what I'm going to talk about today is our plan to, um, of what to do with the minimal cells. So um, the main idea of me talking is also, which I'm really grateful for talking today, is um, to get some input on our ideas and what we're trying to do. And maybe someone has a nice idea or might have some input. The project is part of a collaborative research center called Predictability and Evolution, which deals with the predictability of of uh, different kinds of systems. When we want to um, predict evolution, we are talking about the prediction of the phenotype. And the reason for this can be seen here in two figures. Uh, the one figure shows the sequence space of the genotype, and this figure shows, um, the right figure shows the phenotype. And um, this is the sequence space of two independently evolving populations with the same start point here depicted in black. And each node represents one mutation that happened in the cell. And the main, the main idea is basically that if you have um, that different kinds of mutations can basically lead to the same phenotype. Like for example, if you have um, a protein which is increasing in abundance, then um, you can assume that there are many kinds of different uh, mutations that could lead to the specific phenotype. So the main idea is that detailed genetic evolution is not repeatable. However, phenotypic evolution can be similar and repeatable and therefore also predictable. Evolution is often um, depicted as a landscape in which a certain genotype or a phenotype is associated with a fitness. And um, what we are interested in is if we have a system which is uh, at a non-optimal fitness state and we let the system evolve, it can, it can lead to different kinds of optima, fitness optima. And um, what we are interested in seeing is uh, local and global, global fitness optima as well as the evolutionary path towards them. So our main idea for an experiment is to use a lot of different populations and let these populations evolve independently. And what we want to see is if um, the phenotype is clustering and if we see um, different kinds of clusters and if these clusters lead to uh, different kinds of fitness optima and also um, if we also see this trend in the, in the evolutionary path. So yeah, but what we want to know is phenotypic variation across multiple populations during adaptive laboratory evolution. Another part of the project is to compare the experimental results also with predicted um, fitness calculations. And uh, we want to use a framework which was developed um, at our lab at the CCB called Growth Balance Analysis. And it's a metabolic network model, which um, also um, has a ribosome reaction, which accounts for protein allocation. It includes nonlinear reaction kinetics, density constraints, and mass and flux balance. And it gives, an, um, like the output of the model is um, <clears throat> growth rate, as well as um, protein concentrations. And yeah, we want to see if we can basically um, see an overlap of, of predicted and experiment. So uh, experimentally, we want to see phenotypic repeatability and computational, computationally, we are interested in the predictability of evolution. Um, yeah, we want to use the minimal cell, of course, um, because um, the minimal cell presents a really nice system to study this because it makes the system way more easy or like it reduces, um, it reduces our question. And um, there have been some really nice uh, papers already about the evolution of a minimal cell, which um, many of you will probably be aware of. 
And um, yeah, so it has been nicely established that the minimal cell can evolve um, similarly to the non-minimal cell um, in terms of fitness. So the minimal cell is a suitable model organism for our problem. And another really interesting um, paper from Sandberg et al. Um, was how they um, already used, I believe, 10 replicates and that these replicates evolve over a couple hundred generations. And at the end, they did um, transcriptomics and basically already could see some clustering of gene expression patterns, which is really what we are interested in seeing. And uh, the difference to, to this experiment, um, to what we are planning to do, is basically that we want to use more replicates and we are also interested in looking at the evolutionary trajectories. So not only the endpoint, but also in the middle. Um, so this is our experimental design. We want to use the minimal cell to do a lot of replicates, subject these um, to long-term evolution. And at the end, we want to do omics-based measurements. Um, and also we want to do omics-based measurements from intermediate populations. Um, the system we are using is in Cologne. It is a robotics platform, which basically is able to um, measure the OD of these um, 96 well plates and is able to do individually tuned dilutions to keep the cells in a continuous exponential growth. And um, now I'm gonna talk quickly about what um, our main concerns are with, these, with this design and what we are currently looking at in the literature. I'm sure that many of our questions will be resolved once I've actually started working with the cells, which I uh, will be probably in November, um, but I'm just gonna go through our main um, things we are currently thinking about. Uh, the first one is um, that we are not sure how to measure growth because uh, we are interested in doing real-time growth measurements, which I've heard can be difficult with the, with the cells especially because um, OD measurements and phenol rep measurements, I believe, are used. Um, um, yeah, and sorry, I've just started hearing myself uh, double, but I'm keep going. Um, because we are using, uh, we want to use real time measurements because we are interested in seeing um, if, if there is a certain skip in growth rate, which might indicate that there are some interesting things happening in the cell. And um, we are just brainstorming ideas of what we, we might do. And one thing which has been done in E. coli is to introduce a luminescence vector. And this might be something, uh, I'm not sure if this was thought about of doing with the minimal cell or something, but this is something we are thinking about as well as how much volume we would need to do these experiments. Um, yeah, because we are interested in having a con like a constant environment, which is kept continuous and continuous exponential growth and everything, we are thinking about um, using a defined medium as well. Uh, I'm come. I will come back to this later as well. And um, yeah, we're also thinking about how to to mix the cells well. As for what selection pressures we want to expose the organism to. Um, we are currently um, looking at which kind of dimensions we want to explore and how much start points we want to use. And things we are thinking about are knockout studies or introducing a new gene. Um, basically also depending on how easy it is to do with a minimal cell. Um, yeah, if we are able to use a defined medium, which I'm not sure of, it would also be really easy because then we could just um, take away a sugar source or introduce a sugar source or something like that. Um, something which might also be interesting is changing environmental conditions. We were also thinking about temperature. So we're really excited about the talks next Tuesday about the temperature changes uh, and adaptive laboratory evolution. And another thing which might be interesting is to increase the mutation rate of the cells and see if this might make a difference. For the omics measurements, um, our main concern is if we can easily freeze and thaw the cells, uh, because this would be really necessary for, for this kind of experiment. And also in proteomics and metabolomics protocols, which unfortunately I haven't found a lot. So I'm not sure how easy it is to do. Um, based on this, we, we might do other things like transcriptomics or, um, yeah, it, it would be nice to, to get some input 
on how easy these kinds of measurements are for the minimal cell and how well the protocols work. And um, other things we are interested in because we also want to compare the results to models like measuring size and volume or also cell density. So to conclude, uh, we have two main open questions we are currently dealing with. The first one is if our experimental design is feasible. The two main things we are currently unsure about is how to measure growth and if the cells can be easily frozen and thawed. And it would be really nice to get some input on um, some protocols for omics measurements, um, if this is possible to be shared, like some details um, or experiences just in general. And um, the other thing is what selection pressures to apply. And uh, we are currently just reading about what has already been done before and what might be interesting, because there's also some a nice paper from Breuer et al. who who, in which they um, compared the in vivo and in silico essentiality of, of the genes, the FBA model and um, the in vivo transposon studies. And they suggested 12 genes to be deleted for further knockout studies. And I'm not sure if this has already been done before by now. And um, yeah, because we are interested in using the defined medium, um, it would be nice if, if, um, if there's also some research being done on how um, um, different kinds of media compositions and how well the cells are able to grow in this medium. Yeah, and with this, I want to <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry again for, for the inconvenience at the start. Um, yeah, I'm open for questions and um, yes, some inputs. And then I will mute or stop sharing the screen immediately. So I hope no one hears themselves double now. <laughs> so, so I'm back, I'm back and still, and still with a little, with reverb. little reverb. Oh. Um, how about this? <laughs> how, about how about now? Well, we're going to have, have this. this. Leah, Leah, so, so the, first the first thing we thing need to do, do is, is probably have a, have a video conference, conference with, with 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 um, um, Martin Martin, your your advisor, your advisor UND, UND. Mm -hmm. and, and um, I, I can, I can answer, answer most of most those of questions, questions that you that you pose. pose. Um, um, the, evolution the evolution studies, studies in, in the minimal, minimal cell, cell are hard, are hard because, because optical, optical density, density is not a is great, not great measurement yeah. of growth. The, the SAIN lab, lab does, does use, use it, though. It though. So they so may they be able, able to help you. Help you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quiet, quiet and see if anyone, see else, anyone else has questions, has questions then. then. I have one. I have one. Uh, I uh, just, I just, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, how Leah, if you mute your mic while the question's coming in, that might help. Yeah, yeah. Already, already done that, yes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. so I was just wondering how easy it would be to adapt the GBA algorithm to the minimal cell. You'd have to do that, right? Like, I guess at the moment it works with data from some other cell. Uh, yes, uh, we are currently, we, we haven't done that yet. So um, it is still because uh, the, like I've started like two months ago and we are currently just figuring out if the minimal cell would be a good organism to use, which we believe would be, it would be really nice to be able to use the minimal cell for this kind of study. And um, the GBA would be, um, it's gonna be developed soon, but I'm not sure what you mean exactly, if you mean like how sorry, we would sorry. develop it or which kind of parameters we would need to, to use or what do you mean? What is a, what GBA, is a GBA algorithm? algorithm? Um, it was the model I, I talked about, the growth balance analysis model. It's like a framework for doing this uh, modeling approach. Yes. Yeah, no, my question was related to the fact that I, I haven't read about it, but I assume it's been used before this framework for, an, for other organisms. And I was just curious how easy it would be to adapt it to a new organism that I guess has different reactions different K cats and KNs and so on. But I guess, yeah, you'll find out you don't know yet. 
Uh, yes, I'm. I'm also. I'm a biochemist, <laughs> but I. I hope that I will get some more training in in the bioinformatician tools and the modeling tools. But I believe what's usually done is that you just take a model which is already published, or because you have the metabolic framework, and then you um, use a lot of like you adapt the model to your use, and of course you have to do some some search and adapt the parameter, parameters and also um, of course you have to adapt the kinetic parameters and find uh, ones that are um, that can be used in our group like I don't know if you're interested in the kinetic parameters but we've also have some research going on on um, using a machine modeling approach to predict km and kcat values so this might be something which might be interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. I I might get in touch. Thank you very much for the presentation.